I just want to again thank each and every one who has come to hear the word of the Lord this morning. I also want to uh, thank and appreciate those who are listening live on our YouTube channel, our Facebook channel, and ultimately on Living Word Radio. Thank you for being with us. And uh, our sermon title today is Coming Up Short. Now, you're going to ask a question, well, does he, is he saying that I'm coming up short? Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. But you'll find out what the sermon title means as we go along. Now, Jesus here in this story is on his way to Jerusalem, uh, but this time is for the last time. He knew what awaited him there, and we knew what awaited him there. Rejection, crucifixion, torture, humiliation, and death. But still, on his way, as he made his way to Jerusalem, and him knowing this, uh, he made his way to the city of Jericho, and these crowds were following him. And they brought their sick and dying, and they hung on every single word that Jesus was saying. And why? Because when Jesus spoke, it commanded attention. They desired what he had to say. Now, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, because that is where we are going to spend most of our time this morning. Luke chapter 19 is a very familiar story, and uh, one that you'll instantly recognize. So that's Luke chapter 19. And uh, you'll find out here that we're talking about a fellow named... Okay, so I need uh, someone... I'm going to do a poll here now. How do you pronounce this person's name? Now, I went online and did a, a check, and there's two versions. Is it Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus? Okay, who here would say Zacchaeus? Raise your hands. Okay, and who here would say Zacchaeus? Okay, so the little ones will say Zacchaeus, the adults will say Zacchaeus. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay. All right, so for our purposes this morning, I guess I'll, you know something? I'm going to go along with the kids this morning. I'm going to say Zacchaeus, okay? And uh, we're going to talk about how Zacchaeus meets Jesus. So in verse 1 of 19, the Bible says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a name Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now, we need to understand a little bit more about Zacchaeus because the story goes on to say how he, what, climbed a tree, right? Because he was short. He was short stature. He couldn't see above the crowd, right? And so his way, that's right, his way of getting above the crowd was climbing this tree. But who was Zacchaeus? Who was he? So let's understand this. So we need to understand what a tax collector was in those days. And their position in Jewish society will help us understand the significance of this story of Zacchaeus meeting Jesus. Roman taxes were collected by the Jewish independent contractors who worked in close association with the Romans. Now, who were the Romans? The Romans were a pagan kingdom, as they say. And what did they do? They were basically held the Jews as slaves in bondage. They weren't free. They were not free to do what they did. They weren't allowed to basically govern themselves outside of Roman influence. There was, they were basically under oppressive Roman rule. And because they were under oppressive Roman rule, they were required to pay, the Jews were required to pay, a religious tax to the Jewish authorities for the maintenance of the temple. That, you know, that in itself is not so bad, I guess, right? You know, it depends how you look at that. But the second one really cut to the heart of the Jews of the day. A civil tax to the Roman government, often collected by harsh method, methods. So in other words, if you didn't pay it, you were going to reap the consequences for not paying it, and it was severe. And the Roman tax included both direct income tax and custom duties. Duties were paid on traded goods, while merchants also paid tolls to use roads and bridges and to enter towns. Historians estimate that the tax burden on the Jewish people must have approached 30 to 40 percent, maybe even higher. Now we look at that today and we say, wow, 
Are, are we paying 30 to 40 percent taxes? And uh, I don't know the answer to that. But the tax is something to think about. The tax collectors paid a fixed sum. These tax collectors, they paid a fixed sum to the, for the right to collect, and anything above those amounts became what? Profit. It became profit. And these men became wealthy at the expense of their countrymen. Therefore, tax, collect tax collectors were actually despised by their fellow Jews. Now, they, we understand that the Jews are under oppression. But these tax collectors, the Jews actually despised and hated them because they looked at them this way. The, these Jews rejected these tax collectors socially. They regarded them as traitors. They were excommunicated as apostates. They weren't real Jews because they were working for the Romans. They were not allowed to hold any office within their own communities, and they were not allowed to testify in Jewish legal courts. They were treated as the lowest class citizens possible, and they were treated as the lowest class of sinners. Rabbis debated whether it was possible for, Eve, for these Jewish tax, tax collectors to experience true repentance. They felt that they were outside of the opportunity for true repentance. Now that's pretty, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Now with this, this in mind, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 21. And Matthew 21 relays a story of a certain man who had two sons. And uh, let's turn there, Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. Matthew 21. And verses 28 to 32. So verse 28 says here, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. So he went and worked in the vineyard. Verse 30, And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. So he didn't go. He promised to go, but he didn't go. And verse 31. Whether of them twains, or which one of them, did the will of his father? They said unto him the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. I'm going to read that again. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. That's a very sobering statement from Jesus. And uh, so it goes on to say that in, uh, however, Jesus and Zacchaeus, this hated traitor, had a divine appointment beneath a sycamore tree. What does that have to do with this story? So basically, it's this. Go back to Luke chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. Luke 19 and verse 3 says, And he sought to see, and I'm talking about Zacchaeus, and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press. So basically, he couldn't see for the crowd. Right? Because he was little of stature. And of course, in our terminology, we say he was short. He wasn't very tall. And he ran before and ran ahead of the crowd, basically, and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. So our reading in Matthew 21 was talking about publicans and sinners. And it was talking about a commitment level of these publicans and sinners that Jesus said they could get to the place in their lives that they could repent. So what Jesus is saying here in the story of Zacchaeus is that because these publicans and sinners can have an opportunity of repentance, and many did, that Zacchaeus was no different. He could have an opportunity to repent as well. And so, no doubt, Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus. How could he not? Jesus was all over the news. You know, Jesus had basically, remember, Jesus was on his way to be crucified, to be tortured. He was at the end of his ministry. And so Zacchaeus obviously knew the story 
of Jesus. Perhaps he even saw him before. He was curious to be sure. However, Scripture tells us that God had been doing a little internal work as well. In John chapter 6, verse 44, it says, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. That text is a comforting text because it includes all of us, right? Zacchaeus had begun to feel his deep need for forgiveness and restoration, and he desperately wanted to see Jesus. But he had a significant problem. He was height-challenged in this massive crowd. And no matter how high he jumped, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he did the next best thing. He ran ahead and climbed a tree. And that's pretty resourceful, isn't it? Right? But, you know, the, the children know this story very well, right? They're taught this story because it's a very, you know, interesting story. It has sort of a childlike quality to it in certain aspects. But it's profound in knowing Zacchaeus because he felt the need to see Jesus. And that's the key. He had a deep desire to see Jesus. And so Jesus could have kept right on walking. But instead he stopped as this massive crowd was around him. He stopped and looked up. And he saw this man hanging onto a branch of a sycamore tree. And uh, what do you think Jesus thought? What do you think he thought? What's that? Brave. You know, this guy, Zacchaeus, didn't mind standing out amongst the crowd, did he? He wanted to be seen by Jesus, and he did something about it. So as the crowd followed Jesus' gaze, and they all saw, all they saw was a short tax collector up a tree, but Jesus saw a man who wanted a different life and who was eager for salvation, and Jesus was thrilled. A massive crowd all around him. And we, there's a lot of stories in the Bible of individuals amidst, amidst crowds who stood up. The woman with the issue of blood. Right, that's one. And here was this woman who did everything she could to just, to just reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And the Bible says virtue went out of Jesus and healed her right on the spot. I, th- I, found that, I find that profound. I really do. Luke 19.5 goes on to say, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. I'm coming to your house, Zacchaeus. Did, do you think Zacchaeus expected that? Jesus called him by name. Just as Jesus called the 12 disciples, he knew them by name before he called them. He called Zacchaeus by name. A man, a tax collector, someone who was rejected and despised amongst his own countrymen. He called him by name. He not only called him by name, he wanted to go to this sinner's house. We talked about that this morning, didn't we, Rowena? Talking about going out into places that Jesus went out into. Jesus went into, wanted to come in to sup with this tax collector who was despised by his own people. Matthew 9, 10, 11 says this, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, basically to eat supper, Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with the publicans and the sinners? Why? Luke 15, 1 and 2. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured. You like that word, murmuring? Is it a good word? They murmured, they complained, they griped, and saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. These Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus right then and there. Why? 
because the Pharisees had gotten to a place where they only saw within their own sphere, tight circle, the plan of salvation. Right here. And if you weren't in there, you were lost. And Jesus, here was Jesus mingling. It's, it was worse than mingling with the heathen. And we don't use that word today. But that's how the Pharisees looked at it. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus in Revelation, and you know them very well. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door, and what does he do? Knock. He knocks. I stand at the door, and he knocks. And if any man, any woman, any child hear my voice and open the door, that's the key. All we have to do is take that door handle and open it. That's all. Open the door. I will come into him or her or that child, and I will sup with him. I will commune with him. I will bless him or her, and he with me. And Zacchaeus, guess what Zacchaeus did? He opened the door of his heart and invited Jesus in, continuing in Luke chapter 19, verses 6 and 7. And he, that's Zacchaeus, made haste. So Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down out of this tree. I want to visit you in your own house. And Zacchaeus didn't say, well, Lord, no, listen. <laughs> Look, I'm not worthy for you to enter my doors. He didn't say that. He made haste. He was thrilled that Jesus invited himself to his house. Isn't that awesome? He made haste and came down and received him joyfully. So Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, guess what? They all murmured. They all griped. They all complained, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. These people had lost sight of what it means to be saved by Jesus. Amen? Can you imagine the thrill that went through the heart of Zacchaeus? Jesus wants to come to my house. Can you imagine if in physical form, you know, Jesus walked in this door right now, just opened these doors, walked in in physical presence and said, you know, Debbie, I'm coming to your house for dinner today. Or Karen, I'm coming to your house for dinner today. Or Pastor Larry and Janet, I'm coming to your house today. Would we be thrilled? We should be thrilled, right? I'm, I'm, and I'm saying we would be thrilled, wouldn't we? I'm not saying we wouldn't. I'm just portraying that, you know. This is what Jesus did to Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house. And he was thrilled. But the crowds, however, were absolutely, unequivocally shocked. Jesus wants to go to the house of this guy? This guy? He's the poster boy for sinners. They have his photo at the post office. He's an outcast. He's a thief. He's a no good traitor. But you know something? The crowd wasn't entirely lying. Zacchaeus was all of those things. He was, and more. He had become rich by oppressing the very people who were in that crowd. So were they justified in thinking that way? I'm not going to say they were, but that would be the natural human understanding, right? The, un the natural consequence or the natural progression of seeing someone who constantly stole from, their, from his very own, right? It would be a natural understanding. Jesus knew exactly who Zacchaeus was and what he had done, but he also saw past all that to the man that Zacchaeus could be. And we can say a hearty amen to that because I know for one Self, I can look at myself. I stand up here only because Jesus could see past me through what I was. 
And the same is for each and every single person here. Right? Or anyone listening online. There's still hope. Now, while the mumblers and grumblers were in the corner considering all of Zacchaeus' offenses, Jesus was changing a life. And the evidence of that changed life is seen in what Zacchaeus did next. Luke 19, verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. No. Fourfold. <laughs> now, that's a lot. You know, so basically, if he stole, you know, $1,000, he's restoring $4,000. Or whatever it was. But you know something? This declaration, was he, was he sincere? And the, Jesus is clear. This man was very sincere. This declaration shows the depth of Zacchaeus' transformation. He was clearly remorseful over his sins. He was willing to make it right, even at great personal cost as required by the law. What was the law? Well, the law says in Exodus 22.1, If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he, will, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So if you were caught stealing and you recognize it, or even if you weren't caught, you, you had remorse, you were repentant, you were going to go and give, you stole an ox, you're going to give him five back. And be, that's right. So, you know, the reality is Zacchaeus didn't do it because he had to. He did it because he wanted to. Jesus' response was immediate. And I am certain he spoke with a smile on his face, 19.9 in Luke. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to this house. Come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Wow. Okay. So now Jesus is calling this sinner, this traitor, a what? A son of Abraham. Now, who did, he, did he say that for the benefit of Zacchaeus? No way. He said that for the benefit of the murmurers and the grumblers who were saying this man had no right to be considered a son of Abraham. There was no hope for this person. Zacchaeus was a Jew, so he's already a descendant of Abraham in the physical sense, but he was in a lost condition. Now, according to Jesus, because of repentance and faith, Zacchaeus became a descendant of Abraham in the spiritual sense, as each and every one here has that opportunity. You hear the phrase spiritual Jews or spiritual descendants of Abraham. Well, that's what we are. All right, that's what we are. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 29, our scripture reading this morning, let me read it again. And it's a wonderful promise. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew, there is neither Greek, there is neither bond, there is neither free, there is neither male, there is neither female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, you could preach a thousand sermons just on that alone. Honestly. And that sort of, you know that phrase, everything's level at the foot of the cross. You ever hear that before? That's what that's all about. That's what that's all about. So we are never to look at other people lower than ourselves. Or some person might have wonderful gifts. You know, wonderful gifts. But am I to, if I have wonderful gifts, or someone else has wonderful gifts, am I to look at someone else who I perceive does not have those as many as wonderful gifts as I do? Absolutely not. Jesus loves that person just the same. Just the same. And Jesus didn't stop there. He extended the salvation to everyone in his relentless pursuit of lost people. Jesus 
He's on a relentless pursuit of lost people. Luke 19.10, continuing. For the Son of Man, we know this one very well, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, he's coming to seek and to save those who are lost. We may read the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus and come to the wrong conclusion that it was Zacchaeus who made the first move. If you just look at Zacchaeus running ahead of the crowd and climbing that sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, or if Jesus could see him, we would sort of assume that it was Zacchaeus made the first move. Remember, Jesus comes to seek and to save who is lost. The imagery comes through in this poem. I didn't know this poem. I just It was just a fluke that I came across this poem. Now, I'm going to say a fluke. I would say God directed me to this poem. I can't read the entire thing because it's too long. But I'm going to read a little excerpt of it, okay? And the imagery comes through in this poem. It's called The Hound of Heaven. I don't know if anyone's heard it before, but it's from a 19th century British poet, Francis Thompson. And although Thompson was a follower of Christ, he struggled with poverty, and he struggled with poor health, and he struggled with an addiction, actually, to opium at one point in his life. But in the poem, Thompson describes his flight from God, but also the unrelenting love of Jesus, the hound of heaven. So Jesus is the hound of heaven. Okay? Now, we've heard the phrase before, the hounds of hell. right? I know I have. This is not that. The hound of heaven. Just listen to these few verses I decided to pick up. Now, this, remember, is this British poet Francis Thompson, and he's talking in the first person. So when he says I, he's talking about himself. Okay? I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways. Of my own mind and in the midst of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped, I shot precipitated, adown titanic glooms of chasmid fears. From those strong feet that followed, let me say that again, from those strong feet, capital F, that followed, followed after, but with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace. Deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat, more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. I'm going to stop there. That last line is in quotation marks. And it, he's putting this phrase that Jesus is saying it, saying it to him. Jesus is following him, is seeking him seeking to save who was lost. And he's saying to this poet, all things that betrayed me, betraying you. I was despised. I was afflicted. I was humiliated. These things are afflicting you. But you're in good company. Remember, Jesus said, you know, in this life, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have trials. You're going to have torments. Because why? Jesus said, I suffered all those things. You're in good company. But the advantage we have is that we have Jesus, no matter what. Jesus pursues Thompson with unhurrying chase. In other words, it's deliberate. He doesn't chase him for a little while and say, oh, he's not worthy, I'm just going to go chase someone else. Right? Does Jesus do that? Does he give up on us? Never, ever does he give up on us. It's we ourselves who make that choice, right? It's our deliberate choice where we won't allow Jesus, where we won't open that knot to come in. So 
In his biography, John Stott, I didn't know this individual either, but he was an Anglican theologian and refers to Thompson's poem. And he's talking to himself in the first person. My faith, that is John Stott's faith, is due to Jesus Christ himself, who pursued me relentlessly even when I was running away from him in order to go my own way. You know how I know that's true? Because it's true in my own life. And it's also true if you look at individuals who went down some very, very dark paths, running away from God, whatever it was, alcohol abuse, whatever. They went down, they hit rock bottom. But they live today serving Jesus. Because Jesus is on a relentless pursuit of the lost. That could have been the sermon title today. Relentless Pursuit. So it says here, my faith is due to Jesus Christ himself who pursued, pursued me relentlessly even when I was running away from him in order to, for, in order to go my own way. And if it were not for the gracious pursuit of the hound of heaven, so he's referring this poem, I would today be on the scrap heap of wasted and discarded lives. And by him saying that, triggered in my mind that there is indeed a scrap heap right now as we speak, of wasted and discarded lives. There will come a time when Jesus comes to take us home that there will be multitudes who don't make it. They're lost. Not because Jesus didn't pursue them. Every single opportunity was given to them to walk in the footsteps of Jesus or for Jesus even to carry them. You know that poem, Footsteps in the Sand? You know, there's two sets of footprints. And there were times, you know, that there was only one step, one set of footprints. And this person was complaining, well, how come you weren't with me? There's only one step. I was, I was walking alone. Jesus says, no, I was carrying you. Right? So what brought Zacchaeus in closing to the place of repentance? Well, one thing for sure, it wasn't religious people. Was it? No. Not in his day, I mean. It wasn't religious people in his day. They were going to cast him off. They had rejected him long ago. The answer is, and you all know the answer, it was Jesus. It's always Jesus. It was Jesus who pursued Zacchaeus. And throughout time, to our day, in these last days, Jesus still pursues each and every one of us. Even if we have committed our lives to him, he's still pursuing us every day. It's just when we see ourselves coming up short, we turn, we climb that tree, and there we find salvation waiting there with open arms. Let us take these words and this story to heart. It is a wonderful children's story, but there's so much more in it. It's so very, very powerful. And I know that I've been changed as I studied a little deeper into it. All these people in the Bible were very personal, very personal lives, very real lives. And it's no different here today. Each one here today, each one listening online or watching online, they all have their personal lives. I remember sitting out in the van, I'm closing now, out in the van, out in this parking lot out here, and I was... Uh, I was waiting for Selena to finish up in here, whatever she was doing. And I was just watching all the cars passing back and forth. And then people sort of walking back and forth. And I was saying, you know something, Lord? Sometimes we look at humanity just as a mess, you know? But, you know, you get one car driving down this road with three or four people in it. That's three or four individual lives that have a history. They have an individual history. They have their own, you know, history, their own, their own stories. That Jesus loves each and every one of them, no matter what they're doing. It just hit me like a ton of bricks, you know. Sometimes we can walk around in bubbles, you know. <laughs> like, you know. I don't know. I, I'm just speaking honestly. We, I can go around walking in a bubble and not think about these things, you know. But Jesus has brought us here 
to share the good news of salvation. Jesus is in pursuit of those who are lost, and that's our job. He has given us that great commission, right? Go and teach, sharing the good news of Jesus, baptizing, giving them the wonderful news of salvation. And we don't care about crowns and our, you know, diamonds or gems in our crowns. Really, we don't. Really? We don't do it for that reason, right? We do it because we love Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. Amen. So let's uh, pray. Let's close in prayer. And let's remember Zacchaeus in this new life. I don't know if it's new life, but for me it was. You know, how Jesus is the hound of heaven pursuing relentlessly. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful story of Zacchaeus and how you interacted with him and how you came and you, you wanted to mingle with him. You wanted to come into his house and eat with him and share with him and how Zacchaeus opened his heart in repentance and faith. A grateful father for the story does, that doesn't end there, Lord. Because you said to the crowd, this is a diamond in the rough. This is a person who has repented. And this is a person who I am saving as I speak. Thank you, Father, for being on a relentless pursuit through the ages. In Bible days, in our day. And we think of those people who we come and interact with each and every day whether it's from afar in a mall or whether it's watching someone go driving down the street, whoever it is, you pursue them. You pursue the lost. And I know that you have given us this gift to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, to be convicted and renewed and restored and revived to go and share this love of Jesus. For this is your will for us. Help us, Father, if there's anyone struggling and they feel that they're in this lost condition, that there's no hope, let them take this story of Zacchaeus to heart and realize it's not too late. It's not too late. Thank you, Father, for giving us this blessed hope in Jesus' precious name. Amen.